Good morning and welcome to the Hair Energy webinar. It's an absolute delight to have you in here today. I've been so looking forward to uh, conducting these webinars over a long period of time. In one of the invitations that I sent out to you for attending this webinar, I talked about my yoga. And you know that I've been passionate about that for about 15 or 16 years. And one thing changed for me about three weeks ago. I heard the teacher, let me tell you about what I've been trying to do. I've been trying to hold a crow, something called the crow pose, which is a balancing pose. And I could get into it okay, but I could never hold it. Uh, maybe five or six seconds, but not for any extended period. I heard one thing different at a class about three weeks ago. And the teacher, and I must have heard it a thousand times before, but never heard it. The teacher told me about having my elbows looking at each other when I was going into this pose. And all of a sudden, this crow pose became available to me and I could hold it. And in that little window, I've gone on to do a side crow. And more importantly for me, something that I wanted to do for a long, long time, a headstand. Now I've done one supported maybe three or four years ago, but never by myself. And it gave me this holding this crow gave me the courage muscle, the courage muscle to try something different. And I walked straight up into a headstand. And you must remember, I'm 70 and I had never done a headstand before. So listen in because there might be one thing. Well, I know that there's going to be lots and lots of things in this webinar because my special guest today is Lisa Conway from the Zine Project. Lisa is a salon coach, she's a published author, she's an international speaker, and I have the utmost regard for her. Lisa, welcome. How are you going today? I've, have you done your yoga? I have. I've been to yoga this morning, and I haven't been for four days. I did four days of gym training because I'm wanting to change the structure of my body, and I feel like yoga isn't enough. I love yoga, but I'm going to the gym. So today when I went, I was like a stiff old... I, I, I do love it and I and I'm exactly right I'm here exactly right it's the right teacher you know yeah. and it's about yes we all hear it and we hear this all the time we do retail training with salons all the time and the product rep goes that's what I've been saying and I say yeah but you know what sometimes it's nice to come from somebody else or it's that just that little tweak that makes yes. I, I used to have an expression that uh, an expert is somebody from out of town with a briefcase. Now it's somebody from out of town with a, an iPad and, and <laughs> on a mobile phone. But uh, yeah, and it is. It's just when people arrive. Now, Lisa, your story, your background, you're from country Victoria, I think. Yep. How far out of Melbourne is that? I don't know country Victoria. Yeah, uh, four and a half hours. It's almost halfway between Adelaide and Melbourne. Right. Yeah, and, very, very dry, very flat country. And farming? Yes, my father didn't have a farm or we didn't have a farm. Well, we did, but we weren't wheat farmers. Most of them were wheat and sheep farmers. Right. Uh, but we had a horse stud. So my, um, my dad was a bookmaker, so he used to go to Melbourne every weekend and Ballarat and Bendigo during the week when we were growing up. So he was away a lot. Um, but, yeah, he, he had a horse stud, so trotters is what he had. Okay. I've only ever been to the trots once as well. Now, you're a big, from a big family as well. Yeah, a litter of Labrador pups, I say. <laughs> How many? Five brothers and three sisters. That's so unusual today, isn't it? Yeah, I guess, I guess it is. Um, and look, it was a lovely childhood. And I, I think you learn a lot when you grow up in a mixed family. But when you grow up in a, in a large family, and I think the centre child too, or the middle children, like my brother and I, uh, he's a motor mechanic and I'm a hairdresser. Uh, and the, the next one was a nurse. There's a couple of school teachers. Um, so, yeah, I think there's so much to be to be learnt from other people. So whether it's your immediate family or the people you work with, but I just think that's to be learned, isn't it, from people. So we, we, we didn't have two lessons, as in two siblings. I had eight lessons. So yeah. I think that, that's fantastic. Um, I only have a sister. But... Uh, and one of the things that I think English people lack is, is that sense of extended community. Uh, well, you had your own community. <laughs> yeah, we did, and we weren't close with cousins or things like that. I think we were just a little island on our own. And I guess, yeah, I don't know, mum and dad didn't put a lot of value in spending time with siblings and cousins and things like that. 
I think because we had enough, you know, we had a birthday mm. party, there was enough just for us and you got to invite a few people each and that was kind of it. But yeah, it certainly shaped the person I am today. Yes. What led you to hairdressing? Did you start in country Victoria or where uh, did you start? I, well, I, in the little town where I came from, there was 1,100 people when I grew up and there's, there was 200 kids at the high school. Um, and I didn't, I didn't really think about careers. I just wanted to be a mum, which is really funny. Right. When I, I, don't know, I just wanted to, to get married and have a house and a garden and a dog and chooks and I didn't really have any aspirations. Um, so I left school and became um, an aged care worker. And I absolutely loved it. It was really good. And, but it wasn't a career. Um, I just wanted to get out of high school, basically. And I think a lot of times we move from where we are to somewhere else to get away from where we are rather than mm. plan. Uh, and then I had this incredible experience when I was about 19. I went into a salon in Elizabeth Street and the girl just looked after me like you wouldn't believe. And I had a shitty hair to hair. Um, it was short because my hairdresser at home, we only had one and she didn't really take much time for me. She was more interested in my brothers. <laughs> um, and so nothing really come of it except that I went into that salon and she talked about my hair and how I would grow it and, and what did I really want? And I thought, hmm, okay, like, where's the camera? What's going on here? It was just incredible. Two people blow away my hair at the same time, which was unheard of back in 1984. Um, and it was just amazing. And so I walked out of there that day a foot taller and just felt absolutely for the first time in my life that I was beautiful. Um, I grew up thinking I was a bit play. Um, I had an older, a younger sister and I was just telling her last night on the phone, I said, remember dad used to say after dinner, he'd say, here comes Marianne Conway with a long brown chiffon gown. And, and she'd do this little cat walk and I don't know, she was probably three and I was five. <laughs> Lovely. Long, beautiful blonde hair and she had blue eyes when the other girls all had brown and she was different. And so I, and long legs and all the things that I aspired to have. And so I was like any other plain kid who developed a personality. And um, so I was quirky and funny and, and it was interesting because dad who used to sing this song, um, do -do 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 -do, it was an Irish jig and I used to dance. So that was my thing after dinner. Marianne did the parade and because she was beautiful and I did the, uh, the entertaining because, <laughs> because that was me. And um, we used to laugh at it even years later. Dad used to sing this little tune and I'd dance. So that one experience for me changed me forever. And I went home and I resigned from the hairdressing, um, resigned from my aged care job and I went to Melbourne and I became a hairdresser and the rest yeah. is pretty much history. Yeah, I just thought I want shit what she's having. If you can change a person's life in an instance because you give a shit and you really, really care, sign me up for that. I want that. And that's where it started. And I think that that's often we overlook that as we get a little bit into our careers. We, we, we stop remembering what it was. That's, I, you know, I'm 55 years doing this and I still love the idea of helping somebody look better. But I'm sure there's at some point in that journey, I've forgotten all about it. And it's just remind yourself that you're there to make people look, feel good. Mm, that's your job. And I say the simplest way to do that is people come in as a number. You know, you might, the, the client might come in as a number six and that could be because her hair is tired and dry, but her energy is tired and dry. So if people come in as a six, your job is to send them out at a minimum of nine, possibly a 10. And I had this imagination in my head that when I sent them out, they were spinning, like, like a top would spin. You know, there was an ad when I was growing up, you can tell a Weller woman by the way she wears her hair. I was working for Weller at the time. <laughs> there was an ad and the woman stepped out of the salon and she was just beautiful and her hair was swishy. And, and I used to think, that's how I want my clients to leave. So if you never lose sight of that, I don't think you can go far wrong, you know? So... Some people come in as an eight and they're pretty easy to polish, but some people come in as a two and they require a bit of polishing. So, yeah, that's what you never lose sight of why you joined in the first place. You went on from being a stylist um, to opening your own business. How long did you work in the business? And then how long did you have a business? Uh, I worked for One Boss Sam for 16 years. So because I did a full-time wow. yeah, it was hard to get a job. Um, mm -hmm. And the person Sam gave me the job was the bloke who employed me liked my my boobs. He thought I was <laughs> was fine. I was happy with that, and um, so I was just so happy to stay. I really didn't know what I was doing, to be honest. And so I had to um, bluff my way through quite a bit. 
So I learned a lot from Sam. It wasn't until I decided that I wanted to live closer to my children. And I was travelling 45 minutes. I lived in Gisborne then. And I was travelling into the city to work. So I was happy to do, I think I did three days. And the children had grown up. Um, well, they, hadn't, they were nine. I think the twins were eight and Tess was nine. So they'd grown up um, enough for me to think, yes, I'd like a salon now. I, I, I'd seen too many people struggle with babies in a salon and I never wanted to do that because my main priority was to be a mother. Um, so then I decided I'd get a salon. It was about the time the GST was coming in and people were folding everywhere because they thought, well, how am I going to do this? Because there was a lot of cash in those days. Um, so I just was looking in salons, um, looking in locations, and I wanted to have a salon. Now, my husband didn't want me to have a salon. He liked me working for Sam because he um, was a school teacher and he really liked the, the steadiness of a continual wage and all of that. But he knew that if he didn't let me do it, it was going to be a problem. So um, I started a salon. I think my rent was $112 a week. And I'd done the maths and Simon, um, Simon, that's my partner now, Tony, my husband at the time said, if you can do, I think it was $800, you'll be fine a week. So I had no intention to run a salon. I just wanted to work closer to my children. So the salon, if it was that long, I put the back room halfway so the kids could um, come after school and eat salada biscuits. And I really didn't think about um, being a business owner. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do closer to home. And I thought, I think back in those days, I used to get about $500 and I thought, if I can get $500 for an entire week's work, but I don't have to travel and my children are home, I'm done. And that was my plan, which is pathetic when I think about it now. But family came first to me. So I did that. So really, really, you bought yourself a job, which we often see. I um, bought myself a job. And my, my Sam said to me, you'll never make any money in a street shop, Lisa. And I said, you know what, money's not everything, Sam. You've got money coming out of your bottom and I don't really admire a lot of things in your life, but I do admire my life and my family. So I just told him how it was and I moved on. He helped me. It was 50 k's away, so I wasn't a threat to him or his business. <laughs> he did send me the ones that he didn't want in his salon. He said, no. <laughs> I remember this Indian woman coming. She said, I haven't had a haircut for so many months because nobody touched my hair. And I thought, oh, really? She got on a train to come out and see me. So she gave me those ones. Um, and I, I really, very naive. And I think that's a wonderful quality. I opened the door without one customer. I planned to do my girlfriends and everybody I'd ignored, family, and fill the salon the first week with um, the people that, you know, I didn't want to open the salon and be empty, you know, very visual person, so I didn't want it to look wrong. So I put all my girlfriends in and filled the first two days with that and I thought then something will happen. And then I had to ring them up and cancel them because I put one ad in the paper that, and I said, I'm actually a really good hair cutter, so if you've ever wanted a decent haircut, come and see me. And the phone rang and rang and rang and I booked them in. It was incredible. So I made money the first week. I think I took uh, $1,000 clear the first week and I thought, I got this. <laughs> and we're on the road. Yeah, what is that? I don't ever look back. And I, you know, there was terrible times and I struggled terribly, but I, I had an ability to understand my true value. And as they kept coming thicker and faster, I kept raising the price and I didn't have a problem. So that was it. That's how I started. And, and that, that's a, just one tip there that uh, people often say, how do you go about raising prices? What, what's your word on that? You need a demand. Yeah. You can't raise your price because you need more money. You need to raise your price because you can't fit people in. Right? Yeah. And so and, and that's often overlooked, isn't it? It's very overlooked. And, it, and I think that's the thing that makes me very different to a lot of people that I work with um, because they have a value issue. I've never had a value issue. I've always been comfortable and confident in myself. And if you've got people coming in thick and fast, you can raise the price. That's it. So often they want to raise the price because they're not making any money. But the problem is, um, why aren't you making any money? Why don't you have the customers you want? And if you don't have the customers you want, you need to have a really good look at yourself and your business model and see where the holes are. No good putting 10 new customers in the top of the bucket if there's 10 falling at the bottom. Yeah. I can put 20 in, you're going to lose 20. What's the point? It's a very ex expensive exercise. So that's yeah. what I feel strongly about. There's another point that I'd like to... To make there um, you don't have to raise your whole price list either if you've got a service that's really kicking butt why not just move that service up because it's the one that everybody wants and I think the, there's something in that too Stuart there's a niche you know you need to be niche for something the general purpose person is gone you know um, beauty is a classic example for that 
if you're going to be, try and be everything to everyone, it's not going to work. So get a reputation for cutting curly hair. Get a reputation for um, blondes. Get a reputation for colours that last. Get a reputation for hair up and bridles. I don't care. Get a reputation for skin. Get a reputation for eyebrows. Like if you told me 20 years ago that there would be stores out there that only do brows, I would have said, really? Mm -hmm. You know, there's fabulous salons that we work with and we get them to niche because when you niche, it's what you love. So I niche hair and beauty. I get people asking me all the time, will you coach me? And I say no. Occasionally, I'll say yes to someone. Like I might be a fashion stylist or something. Um, I had a, a approach by a girl who's, um, she is an osteo. You no, know, she's a physiotherapist for dogs. Of course, I'm going to say yes to that one. So although the principles remain the same, all of my content and all of my research is around hair and beauty. So I'm an expert in this field. And the reason I am is because I've really honed into that niche and I've dived really deep. But when you said about putting one price up, that's interesting because often people say, well, no one's buying our X, so we're going to promote the X. Why would you do that? Promote what no. they're buying. Yeah. yeah. You're doing something right there. You know, success leaves clues. So really do what you love. And if they're all coming in for haircuts, let's let's hone in on the haircuts. The other thing is I've never met a salon that I haven't corrected their prices first. So what they do, and I was guilty too, is put two dollars on everything. So a kid's haircut goes up by two dollars, and then so does a head of foils. How does that work? Mm. So well, firstly, we correct things and we look at what the service is and what you charge and what does it cost you to deliver that, you know, and the cost will change if a second year delivers it or a senior delivers it, that's different. But when you understand the cost, then we make an adjustment. Some won't change, some will change a lot. And we try and teach percent, we don't try, we do teach percentages. So we have um, a child's haircut is a percentage less than an adult's haircut. It's not, yeah, so once you get this right, you'll have um, pensioners might be 10% less than it's only on Tuesday. Children's haircuts uh, could be 20% less every day except Saturday or evenings, right? So once you get this right, you put it up by 5%, 7%, 10%, depends on your demand. But what they do is they're so scared to put it up, they're stuck on a zero. This, is, this will make you laugh. When I look at a salon and it's $20, $25, that's $40, that's $110, and I go, okay, they need mail. Why <laughs> stuck on a zero or a five? So then they wait a long time till they're absolutely desperate and then they put it up by five and people go, what's going on here? And the reason you'll know this, you go and look in your bank account and you go, oh, yeah, on 97, whatever, and then you go, what's this $200? Who took $200 out of my bank account? It stands out like dogs. <laughs> because it's a rounded number. Yeah. A rounded number is not an educated number. No, uh, that, that's... Run. Uh, talk about specificity. Well, that's a difficult word to say, isn't it? But uh, if we make the appointment for uh, 10.07, you're going to remember that time rather than 10 o'clock. Uh, and so I think that's a great point that you drive there. Well, why did you decide to become a coach, uh, Lisa? You, you... Uh, because I'm such a go-getter. I'm such a, a doer, right? And I was working in the salon and doing so many things fabulously but I didn't understand targets. I didn't know um, what the ratio should be. That should you, I didn't know the cost of chair, and there's so much I didn't know. And so I was this, um, I had this, uh, I call it the Kavorka, where people are drawn to me, right? People like my energy and they want to be around me because I look the good and I, and I understand the true value of myself and I understand how to make someone feel good. The business side, I didn't know what an average dollar sale, I didn't know what a break even was. My husband gave me a number and said, make more than that. I said, okay. But I didn't understand. The reason I got a business coach because I wanted to leave my marriage. So I remember getting Bruce in and meeting you in, in the pub in Gisborne and I said, look, I'm really interested in you helping me, but I want to tell you something that nobody knows yet. I'm going to leave my husband. And Bruce went, oh, shit. And I said, and I'm really scared to be on my own. Financially, I don't know what I'm doing and so I need some help. And I said, can you give me a couple of months and I'll be back? And I did. Bruce thought, wow, that's pretty ballsy. So I wanted to leave my marriage because I wasn't happy, but I didn't know how I would cope on my own. And I'd never mm. really mastered the money or the numbers. So Bruce had me starting, just count. How many clients do you see? What's the average dollar sale? So if you were to raise the average dollar sale, what does that look like? And my little head went, oh my God, that's amazing. You know, so you've got 100 clients, they pay $55. That's 5,500. Let's yeah. stay with the same 100. 
let's let's get them to give you on average 65. That's six and a half thousand. And yep. the secret about that is you're probably breaking even at five and a half. The next thousand's yours, baby. Mm. Right? So I was, oh my God. And I, want, I wanted to be a coach because I couldn't believe that I was doing so well, but I had no idea what I was doing. So what happened was people in my area came to me and said, could you help me? You know, a couple of towns away and they said, you know, and I was doing this online thing where people started to understand a little bit about what I was doing. And my salon was full to the brim. By then I had five on team and everybody wanted me. You know, I'm cutting away and looking. <laughs> I'm off my finger every second day. And I thought, how do I get them to do it? And it wasn't the haircuts. I had to teach them to sparkle. I had to teach them to understand that people have a number when they arrive. So Bruce taught me all that. And he, he taught me to put my hands in my pocket and stop doing things for people, right? And that was a changing point. And I thought, everybody deserves to have this lesson. And I wanted to teach it in my way. Bruce was fine, but he didn't have, he had no hair, for God's sake. Who's going to listen to him? He didn't know how to teach a second year how to sell a product. So I decided that that's what I was going to do and I be became the coach. And the rest is pretty much history. You, you talked in your th third book and let me congratulate you on, on all of your books, but that one really, uh, I spent Sunday afternoon on the couch uh, reading your book and it was, it was a great afternoon. It was bitterly cold here in Sydney, and, uh, but I was westerly facing and nice warm sunshine. Oh, it was just great, great read, some great stories. Tell me about the meerkats. Oh, the meerkats. I've actually, I'm in um, Queensland now, but I mostly live in Victoria. And a meerkat, I've got a statue of one. But the meerkat is the hairdresser. And so what you're doing is you, you say, can you do this for me? And you give the client a tint to put on and then you go, you know, and you're just sticky nosy. I think if you think the girl can do it, let her do it without you stretching your neck and staring, you know. And if you, if you look up Google um, meerkats, their behaviour is incredible like, hairdressers they're community animals they actually help raise each other's children so they're that um, generous and giving but they're sticky noses <laughs> aren't we all you know yeah. you think well you give a client to someone and she normally have a maybe a level seven tint and you look over and she's mixing a five and then you go what are you doing stop it because it makes the person that you are doing that to feel like you don't trust them and so if we can knock that meerkat out of everybody it's not good, you know. I, I wouldn't like someone to treat me like that. And it, it really does come to the point, if we employ them uh, because they have the skill level that we, we want from them, then let them get on with it. Well, first check them. Until they disprove that they've got the skill level that we've yeah, employed them for. What we do wrong is we let someone into our business who's qualified. You know, I've never seen a certificate of anyone in my entire life. I've never seen anybody's proof that they're qualified. They tell me they're qualified for five years, they're going good. Right? So the problem with that is you give them a whole client. If they ruin it, you've lost the whole client. Why don't you even treat seniors, whereas when they come in, you say, for the first week, you'll be assisting me. And, you know, let them do one haircut and you do the colour. And then if something goes wrong, the client's going to at least love the colour. Mm. And she mightn't be that happy. But if you've got to share, you've got to share all the time. And hairdressers um, are worse than beauty therapists. Beauty therapists let someone spray tan and someone else do the facial and they do this. They don't take a client from start to finish. But hairdressers tend to do that. And then the problem with that is when that hairdresser leaves, so does the client. Whereas if you could job share the client and that comes in and if they have Stuart do the haircut, Lisa do the, um, the cut and blow wave and someone else do the treatment, someone else made the rebooking, they feel like they belong to this community. And that comes back to the meerkat. So if they belong to a community... When Lisa leaves or she's sick or injured, Stuart still does the great haircut. She's, and they know everybody's name. Mm. It's, it's uh, fantastic. I love, love the concept. Now, you, we took, you talk in the, the third book um, about hiring for passion rather than skills. Just walk me through that a little bit. That's, that was the biggest shift of my life. I was looking for qualified people because I didn't have that, right? And where I lived, it was really hard to find qualified hairdressers because we were 50 k's out of the city and anyone who was a groovy, you know, up-to-date hairdresser wanted to be in the city and I don't blame them. So what I found was we had kids that liked horses, rode motorbikes or lived with their parents for a certain, and then they'd bug it off. So it was Edward Beale who said to me, 
Stop hiring people that you think are cooked. No one's cooked. If you train your own, it's going to take you longer. But if you stop whinging about not finding team members and start training your own, and I said, wow, that makes sense. He said, stop tra- skill is the easiest thing to teach. Passion is almost hard to teach, right? So if you say someone is a five out of 10, I can raise that person two levels in their passion. That's it. They're only seven out of 10. I'm still not happy with that. Mm. If someone's a nine or a 10 out of 10, right, and they don't have the skill, that's easy because they're so passionate they'll take on your learnings, right? And this happened to me once as a girl. I called her Leanne in the book, but she wasn't, her name was Mary, but I changed all the names in the book so, you know, it didn't offend anyone. Like the innocent. <laughs> or maybe. Um, and so um, I think when someone says, oh, I love that story about Leanne, I think it was Leanne. Her name is Mary. So she came to me and she was the first person I could give my client to and she would cut the hair better than me. She was beautiful, right? Oh, she didn't talk some days. She didn't actually cross the line in doing anything wrong, but she didn't have the sparkle and the energy that we had. So, and when you spoke to her about it, she goes, what? I didn't say anything. And I think your body <laughs> language... <the> problem. <laughs> problem. But your body language... You know, what you say is 6%. The rest is your body language. So I could be here like this and you'd be, mm. oh, I haven't said anything. Or I could be here like this. That tells a story, you know. So I, I said to Mary, we need to talk about this. And we did. And she improved for about a week. And then she slipped back. We had another conversation. She proved, She said, I'm just a moody bitch. And I said, well, it's not going to work. I said, can you change? She said, I don't think I can. I don't think I, I want to. I said, that's fine. And we agreed to disagree. And that was the last one. And it took huge courage for me to let go of someone who was absolutely brilliant at her task. Absolutely brilliant. But I couldn't stand the, you know, the, the energy in the room was heavy and the girls were all nervous around her. I wasn't because I could hold my own. But the juniors were nervous and it was, it was a shit sandwich. And so I just pulled the pin. And I love, love that. Um, Stefan used to have, I don't know whether he has, I haven't seen it for a while, but he used to have a huge chain, big links like this. And then there was one little one in the middle there. And that was the strength, strength of the chain was the one in the little one in the middle. And it can create such havoc um, if, if you've got that one person. And if you've got one person with a bad attitude, it goes, and you, you tolerate it as an employer, it just goes through the whole thing. Well, why is she getting away with it? And the energy that it requires for you to process that is just too much, right? It's just exhausting and no one needs to do that. It just it doesn't work. And if it's not biting you in the ass now, it's going to bite you in the ass. So why don't you have the conversation and get the person to leave on their own free will? I've never sacked anyone in my life, ever, never. Haven't had to. You know, one girl was stealing... And we had a conversation and she chose to leave. Of course she would. You can't steal when you're here. You know, and, I, and because I caught her, I didn't just sack her and not tell her. I said, this is what I believe's happened. And she said, yes, it has. And she said, I have a problem with that. I said, well, I've got to work here. What do you want to do about it? And she said, well, I think the best thing for me to do is leave. I said, good. So, you know, you know I don't think you ever have to... If you can paint the picture and you can have those conversations with that open conversations. We had a conversation this morning, um, the whole, I don't know how many there is on the team, 11 or so, and we talked about the swearing or not swearing. And it was fabulous. And one of the and one of the coaches had a really different opinion, but I really valued it. I said, absolutely. The trouble is, I'm not really sure what a swear word is. I don't think shit or bum is a swear word, but some people think that's a swear word. And I said to her, it's not that I want to swear, but swearing comes often from passion. When you're really passionate about something, it, it just slips. But what I love is that everybody's opinion was valuable and nobody got shut down and not listened to. And so when we come up at the end of the conversation, what will happen is we'll agree and then the one or the negative one or the one that wasn't didn't come on will have to suck it up and yep. it's all forward. But all that's forward. What people don't do is they don't spend the time to make the rules collectively so we all sign off on it. And what happens, and you can tell a stressed hairdresser or beauty therapist because you go in there and it says, you go in the back room and it says, no more than 12 towels in the dryer. And then it says, rinse your cups. 
okay? Clearly a communication. Why don't you find out who's not rinsing the cups and ask them why aren't they rinsing the cups? Yeah. Maybe get them to understand what the value is of rinsing your own cup. No, we make a big sign and no, and we stick it up there. And then you feel better for about five seconds, but it doesn't work. So no. that all the time. He used to write on everything with a black text or he was terrible. I'd say, what are, I said, you're having a meeting to tell everybody about being late. I said, Loretta's the only one that's late. Talk to her. <laughs> just I'm going to loop back a little bit just while we were still fresh in my mind and I don't miss it I loved uh, the idea of the nine week rule when you've hired a new person because that made so much sense to me because I see people just hanging on and hanging in so could you just take me through that yeah so I think what happens is people don't they get excited and they go oh finally she left and they're so wrapped and I think why did she leave, why didn't you talk to her about it and get her to leave? So they, they employ people and if you've got no idea, right, absolutely no confidence and you don't know really what you're doing when it comes to team, I believe that you can have a bad egg or team member for nine months. That's the average. When I talk to people uh, when I'm coaching and they all say, um, I said, how long have you had her? And they say, oh, it's about seven, eight months. I go, well, you're ready to leave, right? Because they leave about nine months. That's what happens. So through no skill they'll leave at nine months. That's too long. How many clients have they looked after? They can do a lot of damage, right? If you, if you learn this, you can get that in nine weeks, right? Because nine weeks is under the three-month mark. And they might have seen one round of clients or maybe two, depending on your business model, right? So nine weeks is so much better. But if you're really clever, it's nine days. So that's less than a fortnight. They can't do much damage. Sorry. That's okay. And especially when you are working beside them at first. That's why I wouldn't let them touch anyone until I'm sure. Now, it might be two days for someone. could be nine days for someone else. could be longer, right? But it's nine weeks, nine days, or nine months. And the reason I want you to get shorter and sharper is the less amount of damage it'll do in your business. So anyone who's listening who has a salon and think about someone that you had that you just think, why did I keep her that long? I bet you anything, it's magic. It's nine months that you tolerated her. Okay, so let's we we had a rule, I had the 30 odd staff at one point, and we had a rule um, in our household that if I came home and wanted to gossip about somebody two nights on a row, it was time they went. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? That's great. I call that the, um, the woodsy rule. There was a bloke at home who, who um, um, drove trucks and he worked for my brother, one of my brothers. And two brothers used to talk on the phone all the time about business. That was the mechanic and the one who had a earth moving company. And the one who had the earth moving company used to complain about this bloke whose surname was Woods. Oh, you won't believe what Woods he did again. He used to do things like drive the truck under a bridge, you know, when the bridge wasn't high enough. He said, I'm going to kill that. Bastard, he used to say. And the brother who's a mechanic, he said, all right, that's it. You've twice, no more. He goes, what? He goes, I've got better things to do than you ring up here and tell me about Woodsy. He said, two strikes, you're out. Get rid of him or stop telling me. Go and find someone else who'll listen. And that's exactly what you've just said. You said two times and then you're out. So if you're just going to talk to me about it and you're not going to change, what are you doing? Yeah, procrastinating. Your wife was absolutely on the money and they usually are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. We did, we, you talked about average client, Bill. I guess that's one of your roles as a, as a coach, getting them to understand the numbers. Where do you start? How do you set targets? Why, what, when, and how? First thing is you've got to know what you're doing. Right? So if you don't know what you're doing, you can't measure anything and you can't grow. So the first part is the only way to really know what you're actually doing is have the numbers. But most people don't know. I'm shocked at when I present to large rooms, how many people know their average dollar sale and two or three hands below, which is really sad. Right? So you can't have a plan or do a target if you don't know what your average bill is. And that's the truth. The truth is your average dollar bill. And the reason it tells you so much is if you've got a client and she spends $99 and then others spend $120 and some spend $80 and some spend $140, you're average $100. Right? So you can't say, oh, yeah, but we do some colours in here or we do some facials and it, the, the bill's $380. I go, yeah, I know, but you don't have enough of those. You do that and then you do a $16 eyebrow. So you can imagine the gap between there is, you know, mm. right into the middle. So if you know your average dollar bill, then you can say, okay, that makes sense. These ones are pulling it down. These children or these eyebrows only are pulling it down. 
Now, I don't have a problem with doing eyebrows or children, but that needs to be converted into something else. Right? So if you were to do the eyebrows and then sell her a pencil and a mascara and tint her lashes and tint her brows, up it goes. Yeah. So the, the average dollar sale actually tells us what's really going on. So when we start with a salon, say for example, it's $80, I get them a target first. So the $80 average dollar sale, we're gonna make that 105. And then I get them to do the maths. And I say, all right, so you've got 100 clients, the average dollar sale's 85. What is that? And they go, I make them work it out. That's 8,500, right. Now, what if it was 105? And they go, oh, but that's 11,000. I go, oh no. And that catapults them to be exciting. I say, okay, so how will we get $80 to 105? Then we start talking about what we could do. So that would be tinting lashes. That would be um, when they have the eyebrows done. Why don't you suggest laser on your bits or your legs or whatever? And so then they have the true understanding of why it changes. Like you think about when you go into Bunnings or things like that. The reason they ask you, can I help you, is because what else do you need? Somebody told me, I don't know if it's true, they record people leaving and if someone leaves with one item, they count how many people leave with an item because it should leave with one item. So if you come in for a paintbrush, you think I need a paintbrush, and of course you think, I don't know if I've got drop sheets. It's a long since I painted. And then the drop sheets are there right next to it. Then right before you leave the door, there's a dustpan and broom for sale, really cheap. Then there's the... Um, uh, the liquid soap that washes your walls and you think, oh, shit, I don't know if I got any of that, but it's only a couple of dollars. So you take that and before you know it, the average dollar sale, which was a paintbrush, maybe $20, it's now $40. Mm. So it's really not that hard. No. But if you don't understand the concept, and the reason why you need to do it, and this is why people come to us always because they want more clients. And I think, hmm, what do you do with the ones you had? And they go, pardon? And I go, well, you've been in business for eight years. Why don't you have enough clients? Oh, well, some move away, really, 1%. So what's happened? And then we get them to understand that and then realise, stay with 100 for now. And to be honest, sometimes 100 drops. It drops down a few because you have weeded people out, but the average dollar sale is where the secret is. That's what you need to raise. And once they understand that, that's like, <laughs> like this little thing. So cool. So cool to teach. Yes. And, and is any other one area that is it that you look at? for those figures? Is it always the average client bill? Um, that's, that's in the guts of it. But the main metrics, and you'll read this in the Naked Salon, is the number of clients, the retail. So we believe retail should be at least half of the people. So if you're looking after 30 clients, we'd expect 15 as a base. So 15, client, 15 products leave the salon. I don't, I don't want to talk money because you could sell a straightening iron for $300. Yep. Sell lots of tweezers, you know. So mm -hmm. the ratio there. And we, we can get you to 25 clients, 25 products. That's easy, right? Mm. But the minimum requirement is half, okay? So if 100 clients come in the door, 50 products need to leave. That's the first metric. Um, then you've got new clients versus lost. So a lot of people measure the retention of new clients, but I don't want you to do that. I want you to measure the retention of everyone that comes in. And that's the one. I have never met a salon who can tell me that? So I want 25 people came in and 16 weeks ago or 10 weeks ago or whatever it is, how many of those haven't come back? Mm. That's, the answer. That's the truth. And then what are we going to do about them? So the, the top ones, we're making a call. It's Lisa Conway here, just a courtesy call. I noticed you didn't make your next appointment. Have we let you down? Is there anything we could do? And they go, oh, okay. But they just think, oh, something wrong with her. So if you don't measure the loss, that's a hole in your bucket. Okay, so that's a really, really important one. Most people can't do that before we train them. Um, so we've got an average dollar sale. We've got rebooking rate. That's really important as well. And then your key um, focus service. So if it was a brow salon, then their key service might be they want to do feathering or tattooing or something, but they're not doing much of that. They bought all the equipment. They've done all the training. They do one a week. Okay. Right. Yeah. So waxing, the classic example. We've done all the training to do everything else, but we're still waxing. That's where your clients are coming to move to IPL. So same as hairdressing. Everybody in the team needs to have a focus. And that's what do you want to do more of? So, if, you know, nobody very rarely puts down, I want to do more children's haircuts. They want to do more belliage. They want to do more facials. They want to do microdermabrasion. So they bought the equipment, but they're not using it. So if we focus on that and we say, okay, so you do two facials a week, What's your goal? Let's just go make it four. Oh, okay. 
So where are you going to find two facials? And then you, you turn on that um, reticulator that just spots things and then you start looking for them. And then when you do that, that's how you change over your clientele to a better A or B grade client. Well, that was the first bit of feedback we had um, on my end. So how do you communicate that to the team, though, Lisa? How, you, what is your theory, feelings about meetings? Is it a, a once-a-week meeting or is it an ongoing meeting every minute of the day? Uh, no, I think once a week is plenty. And then once you get going, it's about 15 minutes. It's interesting because people sometimes want to stop the meetings um, because we say if, if you don't have a one-to-one -one meeting with your uh, team members every week, we'll find another coach because that's the communication channel. So if you cut that, it doesn't work. So sometimes I say, oh, now everything's sorted and making good money and everything, so now I'm gonna pull back on the meetings. Like, oh, so now that it's good, you're gonna stop rewarding the people with having a voice in your business. How is that gonna work? It doesn't make sense. So no, the meetings are ongoing, they're forever. You can do them like this with Zoom. You're in Sydney and I'm in Queensland. So don't tell me you can't do it. Work out how you're gonna do it. And then they say, oh, I'll pull them back to every second week. I say, okay, so you want to cut the communication in half. Now that you've got your company where you want it to be, you want to cut the communication in half. And they go, oh, wow, that, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> exactly. So mm -hmm. when did you become king? I didn't tell you to make the decision. Stop it. I've actually miscommunicated with you there. That's your communication with your customers. How, as the salon owner, do I communicate with my team to get the results? No, that's with the salon owner and the team members. Right. So, so you're talking to team members? Yes. So every if you work in a salon and you've got four on staff, you need to have four cups of coffee with those people every week. So right. you do it on Monday, Lisa's on Tuesday, Andrea's on Thursday, and Mick's on Friday. So every morning you start the day having a coffee with that person. Now you need to do it outside of the business because it's neutral ground right? and it's not interrupted. Although sometimes you take people outside of the business and then the clients come and go, oh, hello, Lisa, how are you? Go away, I'm doing a meeting. Right? Mm -hmm. but it has to be uninterrupted. So the owner of the business needs to do it. Now if you've got a team of 20, you might have a couple of team leaders. This leader works with those 10 people a week and this leader works with them. So I used to do mine on the same day. So I think it was Thursday morning and I'd sit in the cafe down the road and one would come in at nine, the next one would come in at 9.15, the next one would come at 9.30 and they could have whatever coffee they wanted, take away whatever, and I just paid the bill at the end. And then everybody had these little plans for what they're just going to do in the next week. So it might be put a product in front of the client. That's your plan, right? The trouble with having reviews, and I find beauty people do this, they have a, they're going to have the monthly reviews. Well, a review is about what happened. It's mm. not going to happen. So I don't believe reviews work in our industry. You can have an overall business review, but what we want to do is I just want you this week to wear your lipstick. Fantastic. Tough to topics in those reviews? Do you, how do you, do you, do you yeah, go I, in I, hard? Yeah, I keep a book wherever I go. I'll show you. Sorry for scaring and leaning in. So I keep a book wherever I go. Um, so it's a little bit different this, this, these days. I just write things with a box at the start. So everything is ticked off. So I just keep adding and adding to it. When I had the salon, the book was about half the size and I wrote down observations all week, right? So you can have a name for each, salon, for each team member. And if I saw an observation about somebody, I just wrote it down, good, bad, the otherwise. And then I would bring that up and we have a proper review system that we go through. So it's either a skill, it's either team, so they're either being a team play, player or they're not. It's a skill. They're good at what they're doing or they're not. So if I saw a blow rate that's exceptional, we'll write that down. If I saw a blow rate that's pretty ordinary, write that down and just keep it. And then when I sit down, I write it down. Okay? So then I can talk to them. They're either skill, team, attitude or neglect. Attitude is good attitude or bad attitude or neglect. You're ne neglecting your role in the business. And then if you have enough of those, it comes up and they go, actually, all mine are skill. Or, you know what, there's a few neglects there. And then next week, we're going to go back and say, how'd we go? So there's that accountability. I think what we don't do well is we talk a lot and we don't write anything down. The minute you write it down, it becomes real. Mm. Where big companies, everything's written down, but nobody talks to anybody. Mm. Yes, I, uh, you make a very good point. <laughs> I'm, that, that's one of my weaknesses in life is... is uh, not writing enough stuff down. You, you talk, tackled 
sloppy appearance mm. as an issue. And we already talked about taking that customer from a seven to a 10 or a nine or from a two to a nine, but we don't often do it about staff. So it's a really sore point with me. I wouldn't go to a trainer, a personal trainer, who was eating a pie just to put that down with a big fat belly and then started to train me. And I don't believe anybody would. And I wouldn't buy clothes from a store where the people in the clothing store don't dress well and aren't fashion conscious. So why the hell are you allowed to not have your hair and your appearance the way it is? Now, I could show you, I've got my yoga shorts on the bottom because I've come to learn yoga, but I just think we're visual people. That's why we're in this industry. We love the way people's uh, hair looks. We like the way people look. So if you're not the shining example of what that looks like, what are you doing? You know, and I, the, the amount of people I've smacked and said, put your lipstick on. Like I wear a lipstick, this one, that I put it on in the morning, I can't get it off. It doesn't come off until I use makeup remover. Uh, yeah. Mine, do you like? <laughs> the reason is you've just got to solve the problem. I have people that they say, oh, I don't like makeup on my skin. I think, oh, tell someone who cares. You're in the makeup industry. Find a product that you can use. Right? Stop using bullshit excuses. The reason I get compliments on myself every day is I put the effort in. Okay? There are days when I am shining under the radar and I don't do my hair or my makeup. That's my choice. But I'm actually not working and I'm not representing. That's very rare. I still do a little bit. I call it the Bunnings makeup, which is not much, but I can go to Bunnings. And my mother said she was beautiful, my mother, and she never looked after her skin. She never did anything. She had a fantastic head of hair. She popped on red lipstick and she went down the street. And I can remember as a small child saying to her, what are you putting your lipstick on for, Mum? I said, you just put lipstick on. Said, mm -hmm. And she'd off we go to the shops. And she said, you never know. She said, you know what? I've got nine kids. The last thing I want to do is run into some hoity-toity woman that I went to school with who knows I've got nine kids and I look ordinary. I thought, wow. Right? <laughs> and she had beautiful dark skin and dark hair, like she had almost black hair. And so red lipstick was all she needed. That was it. Right? But that was her, I'm out presenting to the world. And so I've always thought that everybody can look better and you don't need a lot of makeup. I don't wear a lot of makeup and the older I get, the less I wear, as in foundation and things, but I, I eat well and exercise and so my skin's glowing and I put a little bit of foundation on my nose and across here, that's it. Right? Okay. Yeah, but I think that if you don't, if you don't sell and you don't buy what you're about, what are you doing? You, but you, in the book, you you talk about getting the staff to rate themselves. How, can you expand on that for me? So I would give myself, apart from the bottom half, which is sneakers and shorts, I would give myself a ten out of ten. My hair's lovely, my makeup's lovely. I've got modern earrings and a lovely Rolex watch I sport myself with, and I look a ten out of ten. So what I'd say is, every morning when the girls would come in, we'd have to say, "All right, what number are we today, girls?" And so I'm not going to tell you you're a nine, Stuart. I'm not going to tell you. Oh. <laughs> and me included what you are. So what would you give yourself today for appearance, Stuart? Oh, well, I do need a haircut. I acknowledge that. Uh, but I'm uh, nicely shaven, nice clean white shirt, nice button down, nice dress watch, Cartier. So I'm in the eights. I think more than an eight. I think you might lose one hair, one point if you think your haircut needs doing, but I don't think there's anything wrong with your hair. Right. No, it needs, it's, um, it's getting buffy. Yeah. So you don't, you don't feel a 10 today because of your hair, yeah? True. Yeah. So if you feel an eight, you've got to be able to explain why you're an eight. What's your reason? So sometimes, like, actually, my nails need doing. They're not terrible, but they need doing because they've got a regrowth. So I'd lose a point there. I'm a nine. I'd say if I was going to go on stage, I wouldn't do it with my nails like that. I'd, I'd survive it, but it's not my plan. Right? So 10 out of 10 is your jewellery's just been cleaned. You know, that's really polished. You've had a spray tan, all of those things. But if you can explain what you are and why and own it, then I don't have to say to you. And we don't accept anything less than an eight. And we've got to agree what, what you lose points. So you said two points for your hair. I think that's a bit harsh. I think one. Okay. So well, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now we're having a conversation about it. And that's mm. a really good thing. So if everybody had a conversation about their appearance and they owned their own things, then you don't have to do it. 
Fantastic. When you let Mary go, the Anne in the book, you were scared? Yeah, I was. I, I had this courage inside me that thought I needed to change because if I continued to do what I was doing, I knew I was going to get the same result. So, yeah, I was scared, but I thought, you know what, I can't have that. Because for me, happiness and joy is my number one priority. I've always wanted that, and, all, and mostly I do have it. But if I'm not happy, if I have to go into my salon and feel like I can't trust someone, you know, that's, that's no happiness and joy there. So I'd rather do all of the haircuts and be happy and have her do them and have all this eggshell to carry on. I couldn't do it. Yeah. I, I, uh, there was a guy in Oxford Street um, who became a preacher and he said something to me. Um, if, Stuart, you're not a fool, but if you're letting them hurt you, you are a fool and they're burning you. So get rid of the burn. And it, yeah. and it, it does, it frees you up, doesn't it? If that allows you to enjoy what you're doing if you take that person out of your equation. Exactly. And I think you know, while that person's in that position, there's no position available. When you free that position up, someone will come along and you really need to believe in that. And, and people attract people into their lives for a reason. And if you don't believe in yourself and you don't back yourself, you're not going to attract people. That's it. You know? And dogs are great at that. They'll come up to, you know, people will come in and out of your house and there'll be a person that your dog just doesn't like. Mm. And it changed something, isn't it? <laughs> there's, something, there's something that they sense that you can't see yet. And I tell you what, they're right. Even even if it's a selfishness thing, like uh, my dog doesn't particularly like one of my twins because Aaron pays no attention. He's not a dog person and he's not interested in her. And, she, you know, my twins are pretty alike, but she loves the other one. Jake just sits down, has a chat to her and pats her and Aaron goes, oh, yeah, Muriel. And he'll pat her. It's not what he enjoys, whereas Jake's amused by Muriel and her cheekiness and naughtiness. And my daughter, she's even more loves my dog. She calls it her sister. And Muriel is that excited to see Tess. It's amazing. Because there's a, there's a, a mutual giving and receiving in that relationship. And so she likes it. But Aaron, if I say to Aaron, can you take Tess, um, take Muriel for the night? Muriel's like, I don't know how he looks up. He doesn't know how to look after dogs. And she looks worried. I said, she'll do the right movie. He's fine. <laughs> there's this innateness in a, in a human being that understands connection and when you have that connection strong and the person feels it I say this and I used to say this to the kids when they were growing up if that teacher's talking to you and, and you're thinking you're an idiot I said she can smell that don't think it so what you think people can feel so if I'm sitting here thinking I really like Stuart you can feel that from me but if I'm, if I'm thinking, when's this going to end? Because I'm not enjoying myself. That will come through. Yeah. And that's the yes. same with the clients, the same with the staff. And if you want to attract good people into your life, including your salon business, just become a better you. Just be a better person. Uh, and, and say under your breath, I, that person that you don't like, I love you, I love you, I love you, because it's going to come out, isn't it? Well, try and find what you love. I've never met a person that I, that I don't like something about. Now, people, some people take a lot longer to get to know. But mm. if, you, if you can't just say, I like you, I like you, when you don't really feel it, so try and put yourself in their shoes. You know, many a client that I looked after at first was a bit prickly, but when you get to know them, sometimes they've been treated so badly that they are prickly. So mm. be the person who treats them well that they do love you. And I've always loved the quirky and the hard to please because they've got a journey as to why they are where you are. Just keep shining on them and eventually they'll come around. I've only got a couple more questions for you, Lisa. Yes, and we better go. And then we better go. Um, clear on who the clients belong to, I think, is, is so misunderstood. Terrible. Terrible in our industry. And probably more now than ever because people have social media accounts and things like that. And, and this comes back to if I look after this client all the time, no one else touches her, then I believe it's my client. It's not. It belongs to the name on the business. It doesn't even belong to the owner of the business. The clients belong to the business. So I never employed people who had a clientele. I don't need your clientele. I need you to work on my clientele. And my clientele means the name on the front of the business. Right? So if we share them, that makes it much easier. But when you leave, have the, com have the confidence to know that you can do this again. If I started a salon with not one client and I put an ad in the paper and then reputation spread like wildfire, 
I can do that again. So they come with none and they leave with none. And that's the conversation I used to have. And I'd say to people all the time, when you employed someone, I said, so did you have the client conversation who they belong to? And they say, no, no, she'll be fine. I know she's not like that. And I think, yeah, okay. Why? Why can't you have that conversation? When I sell this salon, I'm going to leave the clients here because that's the only decent thing to do. If I can't, if I go sell a salon and then go and work from home, that's, I just think that is the worst thing to do and that is just such a dangerous position karma to be. So that means you haven't got the confidence to find more clients. I don't want more clients. You know, a couple of times I've given over all my accounts to the other coaches and I still might find more clients to coach. So just believe in yourself and work on yourself and the clients belong to the name of the business. That's who they belong to. And so I encourage people to not to say, um, Stuart, your client's here. Stuart, Sarah's here for you. And not, Stuart, here's your nine o'clock. You know, your quarter past three's here. No. But Sarah's here for you to look after today. She's waiting over there. So just these little shifts in your conversation will make a big difference. Yeah, that's great. So the story... What, when I've employed you as a coach, what is my ultimate aim? Do I want to be off the tools or is that my ambition? Or do I want the business to run without me being there? Um, what, how do you go about that? Well, what are your not, thoughts it's there? Not my dream. It's not my dream, it's yours. So you, we have a discovery session. So the first thing we do is we do 15 minutes and that costs you nothing. So I'll talk to anyone for 15 minutes. And that's a way for me to work out whether they're you know, just kind of tell me what it was in 1984 or whether they're ready to make changes because it's, it's the client you don't work with that makes your business. So we do 15 minutes for free and I'm, it's an interview process. You're interviewing me and I'm interviewing you. And then if you tell me what you want and I think there's a chance that I can deliver that for you, then I put you into a discovery session. So a discovery session is uh, 60 minutes with me. It's done exactly like this. But you've got to do some prep work first. I need your figures. Right? I need the incoming traffic. I don't want your financials. I just want your incoming traffic because I'm looking to raise your income. The reason I want to raise your income is a different reason. So when you work on the floor or you want to work off the floor, that's not my choice. The only thing I will say, though, is if you're prepared to work on the floor 40 hours a week, I've never met anyone who can do that for any years at a time because there's so many other jobs that need to be done. So if you, you're happy to employ someone else to do those other jobs, then it will work. Right? And I find that the males often want to be on the floor more than the females. But I can guarantee you, you will make more money if you reduce your hours on the floor. Right? Now, people don't come to me saying I want to make money. They come to me because they've got all other problems. But money is the basis of everything. So if I can get you to make more money, then you've got choices. You could put someone on to do your marketing, put someone on to do your Facebook. You could put someone on to do your, um, all the things you don't want to do. And that comes back to doing the things that you love. So if you love cutting hair or you love doing facials, do them. But do the, do the high-end difficult surgeon's work. Don't do the stuff that you can teach other people to do. You know, so I do all the big-end jobs. I do the product companies and I do all that in my company now. But when I started, I did it, but I've worked myself up. So I wouldn't give, um, I'm not giving this job to anyone yet. This is my job still. So there's two other people who could do this in my company, but I've got seven coaches. So do the difficult work. Do the stuff that, you know, is the highest amount of training because that's the, the longest it takes to give someone else to do. So it's your wish. It's your dream. If you do the discovery session, that costs you $495. And that is a standalone product. You can go away from there going, right, I'm good. I know what to do. We do that a lot for people who want to sell a business. We do that a lot for people who want to buy a business. We do that a lot for people who are in beauty want to incorporate hair and hair. Want to... So it can be a one-stop thing. But often it's a discovery because we're trying to work out whether we're the right match. Now, if you are the right match, we've got three options after that. Four, really. One's an online, which is about to be re-released program. That's, you know... Not much money, I won't, I won't say because we're about to change it. Um, then we've got either a uh, what we call mastermind, so it's a group of eight salons only. That's done like this. Then we have um, face-to-face, which is absolutely 100% private, which is done like this. And then we have a boardroom. Right? So the boardroom is on site a couple of times a year. And there's other, they've all got um, accountability, they've all got check-ins and they've all got 
you know, you've got to re, um, submit your numbers and that's not just talk. If we can't show you four times the return on your investment, we don't want to work with you. Right? So if, if our program costs you $1,500 a month, which is our main program, if we can't show you that growth in a week, it's not the right program. So mm. if you're on 6000 we'll get you to 7500 Now, whether it takes two weeks or two months or wouldn't, you know, maybe three months, that's it. Right? And if that's not a good enough return, return on your investment, and this is what coaches do wrong, I believe, is there's no return on the investment. It's not a guarantee and they just chat. The other thing we do is if you don't do your homework, we'll ask you to leave. Don't lock people into contracts because if you don't think this is the best thing you ever did, go. Go find someone else. I'm not everyone's company. Fantastic. What a wonderful opportunity for everybody out there. Final question. All right. Then we better go. I've got to talk to Rocco yeah. in 13 minutes. Yeah. Have you ever dreamt of being a movie star? <laughs> Who would you be and what film would you like to star in and why? Uh, look, I don't, it'd have to be some old tart who's a bit cheeky, I think. Um, I, look, I've never thought about that, but I did see that on your question list. Never given it any thought. It, yeah. Well, it, I'm a Toastmaster and we do this every week. So, Lisa, two minutes to respond. Well, it'd have to be about some hot chick who's got a bloke half her age and she's on a yacht mm -hmm. <laughs> in the Caribbean. And lots of things happen to her, but she always comes up with the best way to live her life. Um, and if I was going to be a famous person, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, there's no one I really think, oh, I want to be her, because I think everybody's unique. There's bits of people that I like. I really like Ida Buttros. Now, she's not a movie star, but I really admire her ability to stay true to herself. Um, but no, I don't. I don't know. I'll have to think about that a little bit more. I don't know that there's anyone else I want to be. I'm really happy being me. So if you want to make a film about me, you can make it fact or fiction. I don't care, but sign me up. I'll do that for you. No problem at all. Lisa, such a wonderful uh, time we've spent together. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you. You're an absolute delight. And I wish you every success in the Zing Project. My name's Stuart Nicholson. Thank you for joining me on the webinar today. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Stuart. Lovely to talk to you. And you. Bye-bye. Wonderful.